I'm going to talk about this uh, kind of fun case presentation that Dr. Tubbs gave me last year and run you through the case presentation, a little bit of the embryology behind it, um, and then pull us back into how we kind of finally deciphered what exactly was happening in this case. So the case is of a baby born at 38 weeks gestation to a healthy mother, no previous comorbidities. Um, at birth, the child pre uh, presented with anorectal atresia and an imperforate anus. Other than that, though, everything seemed to be otherwise normal. Uh, movement in the upper and lower extremities, as well as deep tendon re reflexes, uh, ultrasound of the abdomen, all came back normal. Uh, all dermatomes tested came back intact, and uh, there was no cutaneous stigmata on the child's back, which is normally indicative of some sort of underlying uh, spinal dysraphism. So in the process of prepping the child to go in for surgical correction of the anorectal atresia, an MRI was taken, uh, which revealed, I'm just going to do this about a hundred times in this presentation, which revealed a uh, discontinuous spinal cord, as you can see, both on the left and right. Uh, that's around the thoracolumbar junction. This occurs. Uh, you can see on the top there's a strong stick like appearance, and then there are these two cords that seem to connect to this lower conus uh, medullaris, which is visible there. Uh, on axial, on the far left, what you're seeing is this the most inferior part of this top bit of spinal cord, and the lower three levels of which uh, had this enlarged central canal, which you can see there. And then dropping with the middle and uh, right hand slide, dropping to the lower part of the cos medullaris, you can see uh, gray matter, white matter, and these rootlets uh, that were present. So typically, uh, this, is, this was obviously a uh, neural tube defect. And typically, that arises from either an issue of primary or secondary neurulation. Uh, neurulation describes the process by which the neural tube is formed, which goes on to give rise to the central nervous system. Uh, so just to give a quick overview, these are both uh, the, the these are both the same picture demonstrating simple things. If you just follow along, A B A B, uh, C D C D should should be able to see how they match up. But primary neurulation is responsible for forming the majority of the neural tube, spanning from brain down to about the thoracic level, um, and it is formed by the folding of this neural plate, this longitudinal folding, uh, in which the neural groove and neural folds start to kind of crust down and then come together and they meet and fuse at the midline as you can see in F and uh, F on the on both of those there they have this midline fusion uh, as soon as this is finished which is the end of primary neurulation is marked by closure of the caudal neuropore secondary neurulation uh, occurs this is a very different process to primary it actually involves the condensation of uh, mesenchymal cells and then transformation from these mesenchymal to epithelial. They call mesenchymal to epithelial transition. Um, there's this imagination of a rod down the center. Anyway, the, at the end of the day, you get this formation of uh, the secondary neural tube, which is typically, in most cases, connected, hopefully, to the primary. Uh, errors in this process for primary, I'm just going to go here, head here and show you this is these aren't showing errors, this is just a side-by-side -side of primary and secondary. Errors in primary, as the neural folds are continuous with the embryonic cutaneous ectoderm, a error in primary neurulation where there's a failure of midline fusion usually results in some sort of overt uh, occult spinal dysrhythm. You get this, this open defect or some sort of cutaneous stigmata. Uh, uh, on the back, whereas in secondary neurulation, you're typically uh, looking at defects in the caudal spine, including urinary tract, conus uh, medullaris, malformations, and just various caudal agenesis pathologies that arise from that. But neither one of these seemed to properly explain what exactly had happened in our case. And so after a little investigation, I ran across this paper uh, from 2014 by Dady, which looked into a third process that he believed existed called junctional neurulation. And he claimed this took place between, in the interlude between the end of primary neurulation and the beginning of secondary neurulation at the thoraco uh, lumbar junction. Um, he says at least he went in to investigate it just given the high propensity of thoraco lumbar. Um, 
malformations that are seen in using a chick, chick embryo, as you can see um, on the right here, using a chick embryo, they kind of traced over the course of 18 hours primary junctional and secondary neural tube uh, formation. I think it is, yeah, it is C and D in which you can see this junctional neural tube uh, formation, and he described it as the elevated folding combined with local cell ingression and accretion of these cells. Uh, and describe the purpose of this interluding process to be to maintain the topographical continuity between the primary and secondary um, neural tube. Now, obviously, this was all proof, uh, proof in concept. Uh, it was all done within a chick embryo. No one had ever reported anything in the actual literature of the human case until three years later when Ivok and his group came out with the first three case reports uh, of imaging, surgical, and electrophysiological examination of three patients who they believe were the first three cases to fit this uh, idea of a junctional neural tube defect. So if you actually look down onto the bottom, what am I doing here? Here, this A, B, C, and D, this is their patient one. It actually looks very, very similar to what we saw in our case reports. So they, um, they went ahead and tested all of this. They found that they were as with ours, they were physically separated, functionally disconnected segments of uh, spinal cord. With all three of their patients at presentation, they all three presented with club feet, atrophy and paralysis of uh, uh, pedal musculature. They had diminished sensation, uh, delayed ability to walk, as well as a uh, complete urinary and fecal incontinence. Now, they went on to open them up and take a look at this. I this was an interesting picture to look, uh, to put in. This is patient one. All of this is patient uh, one, that, that bottom, bottom image that you're seeing here. Um, of interest from these pictures, in the bottom right here you see they did a conductance test of the band that was connecting these two, these two disparate pieces of spinal cord and found that it was conductive, but as, as uh, I've discussed with Dr. Tubbs, there's some methodological errors in, in the way that they were conducting that and the responses that they got, so it's not entirely clear if it's a truly a functional, um, a functional connecting bridge. So by comparison, our case, while looking very similar, had a very different uh, presentation. There was normal extremity movement, there was no um, pedal deformity, nothing to that extent. Um, however, while the a lot of the embryological errors in here seem to point towards a secondary, a defect of secondary neurulation, the caudal agenesis um, in the uh, caudal uh, agenesis is essentially uh, an anorectal atresia, excuse me, the anorectal atresia and caudal agenesis pointed to an issue in the caudal summus during secondary neurulation. However, this functionally disconnected spinal cord in, in conjunction with uh, with Dady and Ibox paper led us to believe, uh, at least retrospectively, that we were looking at the fourth uh, case report of this junctional neural tube defect. Uh, just to follow up a little bit on the patient, the, the case wasn't followed up. Uh, we're, Dr. Tubbs and I were talking about this, so it'd be interesting to see if anyone had actually followed that up since to see, to see if there were any uh, issues in delayed walking after correction, successful correction, the anorectal atresia, the imperforate anus, um, because there were no other neurological deficits or signs of tethering, of spinal cord tethering, it was decided not to um, proceed with any sort of surgery on that spinal cord, but rather opt for uh, observation. Um, something that Dr. Tubbs is pointing out is that considering the fact, or at least assuming that that is a non-functional connection that exists between that superior and inferior chunk of spinal cord, it's most likely that the child uh, will develop total bladder and bowel incontinence. But again, this is all, all conjecture until, um, until followed up upon. It's just a fun, quick little case report that I wanted to, to share with everyone. That's, that's all I have for you.